Chapter 8 of Best Russian Short Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ohm123 Best Russian Short Stories Edited and compiled by Thomas Selger How a Mujik Fed Two Officials by Mikhail Saltikov Skadrin. Once upon a time there were two officers. They were both empty-headed, and so they found themselves one day suddenly transported to an uninhibited isle, as if on a magic carpet. They had passed their whole life in a government department, where records were kept, had been born there, bred there, grown old there and consequently hadn't the least understanding for anything outside of the department. And the only words they knew were, With assurances of the highest esteem, I am your humble servant. But the department was abolished, and as the services of the two officials were no longer needed, they were given their freedom. So the retired officials migrated to Podaseskaya Street in St. Petersburg. Each had his own home, his own cook, and his pension. Waking up on the uninhibited isle, they found themselves lying under the same cover. At first, of course, they couldn't understand what had happened to them, and they spoke as if nothing extraordinary had taken place. What a peculiar dream I had last night, Your Excellency, said the one official. It seemed to me as if I were on an uninhibited isle. Scarcely had he uttered the words when he jumped to his feet. The other official also jumped up. Good Lord, what does this mean? Where are we? they cried out in astonishment. They felt each other to make sure that they were no longer dreaming and finally convinced themselves of the sad reality. Before them stretched the ocean and behind them was a little spot of earth beyond which the ocean stretched again. They began to cry, the first time since the department had been shut down. They looked at each other, and each noticed that the other was clad in nothing but his nightshirt, with his order hanging about his neck. We really should be having our coffee now, observed the one official. Then he beat out himself again of the strange situation he was in, and a second time fell to weeping. What are we going to do now? he sobbed. Even supposing we were to draw up a report, what good would that do? You know what, Your Excellency, replied the other officer. You go to the east, and I'll go to the west. Toward evening we will come back here again, and perhaps we shall have found something. They started to ascertain which was the east and which was the west. Recall that the head of the department had once said to them, If you want to know where the east is, then turn your face to the north, and the east will be on your right. But when they tried to find out which was the north, they turned to the right and to the left and looked around on all sides. Having spent their whole life in the Department of Records, their efforts were all in vain. To my mind, Your Excellency, the best thing to do would be for you to go to the right and me to go to the left, said one officer who had served not only the Department of Records, but also been his teacher of handwriting in the school for reserves, and so was a little bit cleverer. So said, so done. The one official went to the right. He came upon trees bearing all sorts of fruits. Gladly would he have plucked an apple, but they all hung so high that he would have been obliged to climb up. He tried to climb up in vain. All he succeeded in doing was tearing his nightshirt. Then he struck upon a brook. It was swarming with fish. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had all this fish in Potseskaya Street? He thought, and his mouth watered. Then he entered woods and found pet ridges, grouse and hares. Good Lord, what an abundance of food! He cried. His hunger was going up tremendously, but he had to return to the appointed spot with empty hands. He found the other official waiting for him. Well, Your Excellency, how went it? 
did you find anything? Nothing but an old number of the Moscow gadget. Not another thing. The officials lay down to sleep again, but their empty stomachs gave them no rest. They were partly robbed of the sleep by the thought of who was now enjoying their pension, and partly by the recollection of the fruit, fishes, patrices, grouse and hares that they had seen during the day. The human pabulum in its original form flies, swims and grows on trees. Who would have thought it, Your Excellency? said the one official. To be sure, rejoined the other official, I too must admit that I had imagined that our breakfast rolls came into the wall just as they appear on the table. From which it is to be deduced that if we want to eat a pheasant, we must catch it first, kill it, pull its feeders and roast it. But how is that to be done? Yes, how is that to be done? repeated the other official. They turned silent and tried again to fall asleep. But their hunger scared slip away. Before their eyes swam flocks of pheasants and ducks, hearts of porklings, and they were all so juicy. Done so tenderly and garnished so deliciously with olives, capers and pickles. I believe I could devour my own boots now said the one official. Gloves are not bad either, especially if they have been worn quite mellow, said the other official. The two officials stared at each other fixedly. In their glances gleamed an evil boring fire, their teeth chattered, and a dull groaning issued from their breasts. Slowly they crept upon each other, and suddenly they burst into a fearful frenzy. There was a yelling and groaning. The rags flew about, and the official who had been teacher of handwriting bit off his colleague's order and swallowed it. However, the sight of blood brought them back both to their senses. God help us, they cried at the same time. We certainly don't mean to each other up. How could we have come to such a pass since these? What if the genius is making sport of us? We must, by all means, entertain each other to pass the time away. Otherwise, there will be murder and death, said the one official. You begin, said the other. Can you explain why it is that the sun first rises and then sets? Why isn't it the reverse? Aren't you a funny man, Your Excellency? You get up first, then you go to your office and work there, and at night you lie down to sleep. But why can't one assume the opposite? That is, that one goes to bed, sees all sorts of brim figures and then gets up. Well, yes, certainly. But when I was still an official, I always thought this way. Now it is dawn, then it will be day, then will come supper and finally will come the time to go to bed. The word supper recalled that incident in the day's doings, and the thought of it made both officers melancholy, so that the conversation came to a halt. A doctor once told me that human beings can sustain themselves for a long time on their own juices. The one officer began again. What does that mean? It is quite simple, you see. One's own juices generate other juices, and these in their turn steal other juices, and so it goes on until finally all the juices are consumed. And then what happens? Then food has to be taken into the system again. The devil. No matter what topic the official choose, the conversation invariably reverted to the subject of eating, which only increased their appetite more and more. So they decided to keep up talking altogether and recollecting their Moscow gadget that one of them had found. They picked it up and began to read eagerly. Banquet given by the mayor. The table was set for one hundred persons. The magnificence of it exceeded all expectations. The remotest provinces were represented at this feast of the gods by the costliest gifts. The golden stogian from Cessna and the silver fashion from the Caucasian woods held a rendezvous with strawberries so seldom to be had in all latitude in winter. The devil! For God's sake, stop reading, Your Excellency. Couldn't you find something else to read about? cried the other official in sheer desperation. He snatched the paper from his colleague's hands and started to read something else. Our correspondent in Tula informs us that yesterday a stugion was found in the Upa, an event which even the oldest inhabitants cannot recall. 
and all the more remarkable since they recognized a former police captain in the studio. This was made the occasion for giving a banquet in the club. The prime cause of the banquet was served in a large wooden platter garnished with vinegar pickles. A bun so parsley stuck out of its mouth. Dr. P, who acted as Toastmaster, saw to it that everybody present got a piece of the studio. The sauces to go with it were unusually varied and delicate. Permit me, Your Excellency, it seems to me you are not so careful either in the selection of reading matter, interrupted the first officer, who secured the gazette again and started to read. One of the oldest inhabitants of Vierka has discovered a new and highly original recipe for fish soup. A live codfish, lord of vulgaries, is taken and beaten with a rod until its liver swells up with anger. The officer's heads dropped. Whatever their eyes fell upon had something to do with eating. Even their own thoughts were fatal. No matter how much they tried to keep their minds off beef stick and the like, it was all in vain. The fancy returned invariably with irresistible force back to that for which they were so painfully yearning. Suddenly an inspiration came to the official who had once taught handwriting. I have it, he cried delightedly. What do you say to this, Your Excellency? What do you say to our finding a mujik? A mujik, Your Excellency? What sort of a mujik? Why, a plain ordinary mujik. A mujik like all other mujiks. He would get the breakfast rolls for us right away, and he could also catch patrices and fish for us. Hmm, a mujik. But where are we to fetch one from, if there is no mujik here? Why shouldn't there be a mujik here? There are mujiks everywhere. All one has to do is hunt for them. There certainly must be a mujik hiding here somewhere, so as to get out of working. This thought so cheered the officers that they instantly jumped up to go in search of a mujik. For a long while they wandered about on the island without the desired result, until finally a concentrated smell of black braid and old sheepskin assaulted their nostrils and guided them in the right direction. There, under a tree, was a colossal mujik lying fast asleep with his hands under his head. It was clear that to escape his duty to work he had impudently withdrawn to this island. The indignation of the officers knew no bounds. What? Lying asleep here? You lazy bones see you? They ragged at him. It is nothing to you that there are two officers here who are fairly perishing of hunger. Up, forward, march, walk. The mujik rose and looked at the two civil gentlemen standing in front of him. His first thought was to make his escape. But the officers held him fast. He had to submit to his fate. He had to work. First, he climbed up on a tree and plucked several dozen of the finest apples for the officials. He kept a rotten one for himself. Then he turned up the earth and dug out some potatoes. Next, he started a fire with two bits of wood that he rubbed against each other. Out of his own hair, he made a snare and caught patridges. Over the fire, by this time burning brightly, he cooked up so many kinds of food that the question arose in the officers' minds whether they should not give some to this idler. Beholding the efforts of the mujik, they rejoiced in their hearts. They had already forgotten how the day before they had nearly been perishing of hunger, and all they thought of now was, what a good thing it is to be an official. Nothing bad can ever happen to an official. Are you satisfied, gentlemen? The lady mujik asked. Yes, we appreciate your industry, replied the officer. Then you will permit me to rest a little. Go, take a little rest, but first make a good strong cord. The mujik gathered wild hamsterhocks, laid them in water, beat them and broke them, and toward evening a good stout cord was ready. The officials took the cord and bound the mujik to a tree, so that he should not run away. Then they laid themselves to sleep. Thus day after day passed, and the mujik became so skillful that he could actually cook soup for the officials in his bare hands. The officials had become round and well-fed and happy. It reserves them that he had needn't spend any money 
and that in the meanwhile, the pensions were accumulating in St. Petersburg. What is your opinion, Your Excellency? One said to the other after breakfast one day. Is the story of the Tower of Babel true? Don't you think it is simply an allegory? By no means, Your Excellency. I think it was something that really happened. What other explanation is there for the existence of so many different languages on earth? Then the flood must really have taken place too. Certainly. Else, how do you explain the existence of antediluvian animals? Besides, the Moscow Gazette says, Let me search for the old number of the Moscow Gazette, sit themselves in the shade, and read the whole shade from beginning to the end. There were festivities in Moscow, Tula, Panja, and Ryazan, and Strange Ilam felt no discomfort at the description of the delicacies served. There is no saying how long this life might have lasted. Finally, however, it began to bore the officials. They often thought of their cooks in St. Petersburg and even shed a few tears in secret. I wonder how it looks in Polyseska Street now, Your Excellency. One of them said to the other. Oh, don't remind me of it, Your Excellency. I am pining away with homesickness. It is very nice here. There is really no fault to be found with this place. But the lamb longs for its mothership. And it is a pity too for the beautiful uniforms. Yes, indeed. The uniform of the fourth class is no joke. The gold embroidery alone is enough to make one dizzy. Now they began to approach the music to find some way of getting them back to Podaseska Street. And strange to say, the music even knew where Podaseska Street was. He had once drunk beer and made there, and as the saying goes, everything had run down his beard. Alas, but nothing into his mouth. The officers rejoiced and said, We are officers from Podaseska Street. And I am one of those men, do you remember? who sit on a scaffolding hung by ropes from the ropes and paint the outside walls. I am one of those who crawl about on the ropes like flies. That is what I am, replied the mujik. The mujik now pondered long and heavily on how to give great pleasure to his officials, who had been so gracious to him, the lazy bones, and had not scorned his work. And he actually succeeded in constructing a ship, it was not really a ship, but still it was a vessel that would carry them across the ocean close to Podasaska Street. Now take care, you dog, that you don't drown us, said the officers, when they saw that raft raising and falling on the waves. Don't be afraid, we musics are used to this, said the mujik, making all the preparations for the journey. He gathered swans down and made a couch for his two officers. Then he crossed himself and rode off from shore. How frightened the officers were on their way! How seasick they were during the storms! How they scolded the coarse music for his idleness can neither be told nor described. The mujik, however, just kept rowing on and fed his officers on herring. At last they caught sight of dear old Mother Neva. Soon they were in the glorious Catherine Canal, and then, oh joy, they struck the grand Podesteska Street. When the cooks saw their officers so well fed round and so happy, they rejoiced immensely. The officers drank coffee and rolls, and put on their uniforms and drove to the pension bureau. How much money they collected there is another thing that can neither be told nor described. Nor was the music forgotten. The officers sent a glass of whiskey out to him and five kopeck. Now, Mujik, rejoice. End of How a Mujik Fed Two Officers by Mikhail Saltikov's Catherine